Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you again for this day and for the opportunity to be gathered here in this place with this people as we prepare to spend some time in your wonderful word. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and prayers of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. Amen. Jesus is on the way from Jericho to Jerusalem. He's walking along the roadside. And at the edge of town, as he's leaving Jericho, he meets a blind beggar, Bartimaeus. He's sitting at the side of the road, which is a normal place for someone like him to be. He would not be welcomed inside the city limits because of his illness, his blindness. He would be considered impure, unclean. But here, on the outskirts of town, this was an optimal place for him to beg. It's a high traffic area. People are constantly passing by on their way somewhere or another. It's a good place for him to have a chance of receiving a coin or two. And as he hears that Jesus is coming down the road, he cries out, Lord, have mercy on me. Curie, eleison in Latin. It's a simple prayer. Lord, have mercy on me. But a prayer that would become the cornerstone of Christian liturgy to the very present day, curie, a liaison. And the moment that Jesus hears that, he stops in his tracks. Now, he himself is on the way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross. He's on his way to his death. And his heart and his mind must be weighed down with heavy thoughts of all that's awaiting him, the pain and the agony that is to come. But he is not so turned in on himself that he doesn't hear and recognize and stop at this need expressed by this poor man. And Jesus calls Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus throws down the cloak that he's wearing on the ground and jumps up. And this is no insignificant action. You see, that outer garment, that outer cloak that Bartimaeus would have been wrapped in, at night would have been his blanket, his pillow. He would have used that to stay warm when he was sleeping at night. But in the daytime, he would take it off and hold it out like a bag and That was his offering tray to collect the alms that would have been given him. And so you see, in throwing that cloak down, he already could see more clearly than the entourage of people who were traveling with Jesus. Even though he was blind, he could see with much greater vision. He understood that he didn't need this anymore. That with Jesus, he was ready to hit the road in a new direction, that Jesus was the one to lead him and that Jesus was the one that he could follow in a new way. And we see confirmation of that. For when Bartimaeus' eyesight is restored, he didn't go back home. He didn't walk down those old paths that were familiar to him. The Scripture says that he followed Jesus on his way. Last weekend, I went home. Our family took a trip back to stay in the house in which I was raised. My mother still lives there. And while we were driving around visiting our favorite places, we found our way to the church of my childhood, the building that I grew up in. That building was built in the late 19th century, right in the middle of the University of Michigan's campus. About the 1920s, the law school at the University of Michigan wanted the land that the church sat on. Guess who won that battle? So our church, that beloved building, hit the road 
and literally move three blocks down the streets. Every beam, every two-by-four, every fixture, every stone, every rock was carefully marked and labeled, disassembled, carried down the street, and reassembled in exactly the same way. That's the building I grew up in. For 90 years, it was that church at that location. Well, last year, the church decided to hit the road again. The congregation is on its way to a new stage in its history, but this time for a different reason. The church is getting older, declining membership, an aging population. It means that there are not enough resources and not enough people to care for that beloved building. And so the congregation is moving out into the country. And that building was sold to a fraternity. It's now a fraternity house. And it's sad. It's sad to think of my beloved building, so sacred for so many reasons, used in such a secular way. And yet, and yet, a church that hits the road, a church on the move, is actually a really good way to think about the purpose of the church. Did you know that the term the way, the way, that phrase, is the oldest name given to the church of Jesus Christ? Before the word Christian was used, before the word church was used, the followers of Jesus called themselves the way. You remember Saul of Tarsus? Before he had his conversion, became Paul, converted to Christianity. The Bible said he was going out of his way to arrest whom? Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 says he was looking to arrest followers of the way. He wasn't arresting Christians. He was arresting followers of the way. The way. When Jesus met people in his lifetime, it was quite often on the way somewhere, on the road. Two disciples met Jesus on their way to Emmaus. Bartimaeus, in our story today, meets Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. And quite often the stories Jesus told had something spiritually important happen on the road. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? It begins this way. A man was on his way on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Big things happen on the road in Jesus' ministry. And when Jesus sent his disciples out into the world in pairs, he said, hit the road. <laughs> Literally, he sent them on a road trip. He showed them that his ministry was done by walking down dusty, dirt, gravel roads. That's where the work of Christ is done. And so to me, as a historian, I think it's very ironic that 1,500 years later, when the Protestant Reformation was in full swing in the 1520s, and people were leaving the Catholic Church and forming Protestant churches, that there was a great debate that raged among Protestants. And that debate, I mean, it raged. It was a serious debate over whether the bread and cup of communion was the literal body and blood of Christ or the symbolic body and blood of Christ. You with me? There were some that said it's the literal body and blood of Christ because Jesus said in Scripture, this is my body. And the word is, is must be understood literally. Therefore, this is the literal body and blood of Christ. There were others on the other side who said, yes, Jesus did say this is my body, but he also said, I am the way. John 14, 6. I am the way. And the word used for the way is, you guessed it, dusty, dirt, gravel, road. And they said there's no way that Jesus meant I am a dusty, dirt, gravel road. Therefore, the bread and cup is the symbolic body and blood of Christ. Jesus as a dusty, dirt, gravel road. A little offensive, isn't it? On the other hand, it's very appropriate. It's when we look at the whole thing. To meet Jesus is to get out and get on the road. Break out. Break out. 
Move. Be in motion. That's where Jesus is. He's on the road, on the way. Our 21st century world, for as much as the world is flat and we can do group texts to remind people about the youth outing next week, and through Facebook we can link up with people from our past and connect with people all over the world, this 21st century world also has a way of drawing us in on ourselves. Here's an example. 30 years ago, did anybody know the word or the term virtual reality? That was just reality. (laughs) Now, Now virtual reality is commonplace. How many people have a Wii game here? A Wii, W-I-I. So several years ago, my family, we bought a Wii Fit. And for those of you that don't have one, let me explain what this is. You hold, it's a virtual reality game. You hold a remote control in your hand, and there's a console on top of your TV or wherever you put it, and you, without leaving the comforts of your living room or your home, are able to do all kinds of exercises and games that will keep you fit, like bowling, golf, right, and running. As long as you have the, the remote control that's working with the console, you can do all of these things virtually on your TV. Now, the running game intrigued me. As you know, I'm a runner. And so there I watched as my kids with their remote controls were in the living room going like this. <sighs> and before them on the TV screen, they were you know, touring through the streets of France or up and down mountains or on dusty dirt roads through wooded forests. As long as they were moving, the game would tell them how many virtual miles they ran. Now, I, I happen to love Wii golf and bowling. It's a great game. These are, it's, a, it's a game. But there is a, a lesson of spiritual caution here that I think is very important. You see, not only do you, are you insulated from God's creation out there in the reality that out, that's out there, what I notice with my children is that they could be running like this. It didn't matter. Nobody in their right mind runs like this down the street. So there's no attentiveness to honing skill or learning craft or practicing trade. And what's even worse is that as long as you move the remote control, the game thinks you're running. So you don't even have to run. You can just move your arm like this, you see. But here's a lesson of caution. We trick ourselves into thinking that we're doing something when in actuality there's no substitute for getting out and getting on the road and getting on the way. And it's the same way in our lives of faith. We can be tempted into thinking that we found Jesus when in actuality he's out there breaking us outside of our routines, our habits, our rituals, and our walls. In the early 1980s, there was an Episcopalian priest named Tom Behrens in Chicago. And he noticed that the people that walked the street of his neighborhood at night were different than the people who walked the street of his neighborhood during the daytime. And he said to himself, the church is not open at night, at midnight. The building's not open. But those people on the street at night have just as many concerns as the people in the daytime. And they're just as worthy of love as the people in the daytime. And so he started the night ministry in Chicago. Today it's very big. But when it began, it was just Tom Barron's putting on his Episcopalian garb. You know what that is? black Roman collared shirt, black shirt with that tab collar. And he just would go out on the street, literally taking the church to the streets, literally being the church on the move, hitting the road. And he would walk the neighborhood, drop by bars, stand at street corners, 
just being a loving, compassionate, pastoral presence on the streets, ministering in whatever way he could. Well, in 1997, I had an internship with the night ministry in the neighborhood of Uptown. So my job that summer was to wear the black collared, tab collared shirt, night ministry name badge, jeans, from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m., four or five nights a week, would walk about a four block area in the Uptown neighborhood. It consisted of one park, about five bus stops, two bars, Mike's Place and Carol's Pub, a few street corners. And I walked, and I sat, and I listened, and I drank a lot of orange juice, <laughs> visiting with whomever might want to visit. And one night I met a woman named Luann. She was 35 at the time. And the first thing I noticed about her was how different she looked than the rest of the people on the street at night. And by that I mean she smiled. I mean, a from the depths of your heart, uncontrollable, beaming smile. Beautiful, glowing smile. Like she was at peace. Really calm and tranquil. And the second thing I noticed about her was how sickly she looked. Pallid, yellow skin, really emaciated. Turned out that Luann had full-blown AIDS and she would die by the end of the summer. And as we sat there on the street corner, 11 o'clock one night on a random summer night in Chicago, she talked to me very openly about her past. She talked to me about her sickness, about her impending death. And she smiled the whole time. And her sister Barbara was having a hard time with this. Barbara stood behind her this whole conversation and, and was bear-hugging her sister from the back like this, just clutching her and grabbing onto her and shaking her head. Barbara was her younger sister, an illiterate single mother of four children, and she depended on her big sister for so much of her daily existence. She couldn't bear to hear Luann talk about her future. And she never said a word, but she grimaced and winced and shake her head back and forth, almost as though if she could just shake her head hard enough, she could shake a new reality into existence, one in which this nightmare would be over and her sister would be healed. And through it all, Luann just smiled and let her sister hug her like that, and she'd stroke her sister's hand and occasionally would interrupt our conversation to lean back over her shoulder and say, it's okay. It's okay. And to me, in that moment, the gospel of Jesus Christ spoke in this profound and powerful way. The gospel that says life is such that death can come at any time. Bad diagnoses can come at any time. Suffering and pain and hardship can come at any time. And in those moments when they do, we want to grab on and to clutch and hold on to whatever is good and safe and secure and loving and do our very best to wish a new reality into existence. But the hope of the good news says that when we stand in the face of that uncertainty, the voice of Christ says back to us, it's okay because of my resurrection it's okay. It's okay. When I left for work that night, I had no idea what I was going to encounter. But I do know that I had to leave the comforts of my Hyde Park neighborhood with neatly manicured lawns and sprinkler systems and home security alarms and swept sidewalks and go up north to the gritty, panhandling, drug-dealing world of Uptown. And there, on the way, on the side of the road, was Christ. And to me, that may be the most profound lesson that I remember all these years later. 
that sometimes we meet Christ exactly where we expect to meet him. Sometimes we find him in the places we've always found him. But sometimes we have to get out of our own way. Sometimes we have to break out of our habits and our routines that have become rituals. If we walk the paths we've always walked, drive the routes we've always driven, follow the way we've always followed, sit in the same pew we've always sat in and preach from the same pulpit we've always preached from, we may be the ones that are blind to the Christ who lives among us. Let it not be so. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you reveal yourself to us in predictable ways, but also in surprising ways. And may we be willing to hit the road and to break out, to get up, move, and be in motion, and find you and follow you on your way. Amen.